right, we have Scott, Tom, and Steve with Ridgeback. Go ahead, Scott. Hi, everybody. Um, we're, we're happy to be back for chapter two, um, second wing of our discussion. And um, actually, uh, Kevin gave us an opportunity to talk about uh, where Ridgeback lies in the grand scheme of things on the sort of portfolio of products. Um, and so I thought what I would do uh, up front here is do a little refresher if there were people who weren't uh, here last Tuesday night um, or who wanted to probe a little bit the sort of origins and the, and the role of the product. And then we're going to hand it off to Steve and Tom to run an install. If anybody's on the line and wants to get a copy of the product, we're, we're giving um, qualified folks the chance to use it so that we can get feedback on it ourselves. Um, it's a relatively new product. So what's interesting also is I'd never heard of layer eight. Um, and uh, it occurs to me that Ridgeback principally works on layer two and layer eight <laughs> because it exerts an influence on the psychology of the attacker. Um, and so when, when uh, Kevin sort of identified Ridgeback as sort of being an IDS or IPS, uh, we are frequently asked by uh, our, our own customers, like, what, are, what category do you fall into? And it's actually a really hard question to answer. And so I actually don't plan to answer it from our standpoint, but it would be really interesting to have you guys let us know where you think Ridgeback lies in the grand scheme of things. Um, I, I will say that Gartner covers Ridgeback in its relatively new category called automated moving target defense. There's about 10 or 12 companies in that category. And honestly, they we each do something very, very different. Um, but if, if these are probably the, the categories that are most applicable. And so maybe we can get back to where Ridgeback really belongs or if it's all on its own somewhere. So I just wanna go through real quick, a little sort of our own positioning of the product, or at least why, why Tom Phillips, um, our inventor, CTO, uh, invented it, which is to say that over the course of the last 40 years, there's been pretty continuous innovation in security and different product categories have come online. My personal observation is that the uh, improvements are fairly incremental. There's no, there's no evidence of something that changed dramatically the nature of cybersecurity. And I think one, one of the things that we can say uh, from my standpoint is that if you take any product out there, it rolls up as either, either a blocking technology, something that's designed to filter and exclude uh, folks from a network or sensing capabilities that are designed to surveil and assess activity in the environment. So over time, we've added an enormous amount of data from the endpoint, from network systems, to um, models, to, to create algorithms, to judge what's normal behavior. And now we have huge uh, volumes of information being processed by uh, very smart AI-based uh, tools. So from our standpoint, the uh, models used to generate insights from AI are statistical models that they're making inference and they don't necessarily have the concept of veracity of truthfulness of being absolutely factual and and that that creates problems in terms of a security proposition because you end up with false positives uh, false negatives and you can't always be certain whether an incident alert is definitively bad or uh, uh, no, and so you have to investigate it. So um, there's another problem with tools that use analytical or probabilistic analyses to make judgments. And that is that when the data sets are more or less consistent over time, they do a great job. But when you add an adversary to the mix, they uh, have a vote. They can play a role uh, by injecting signals uh, by using attacking techniques that are designed specifically to escape observation by the models that are made to see them. And 
they'll often use the same AI to design the packets that they want to evade detection. So we've still got a situation where there's uh, kind of an arm race. So if we take these two basic, you know, large categories, um, what, what I would say uh, is that Ridgeback and our view of security is adding a different type of capability to address these uh, challenges. So I, I mentioned the uh, observations made by sensing Tech, uh, technologies are inferential, they're not factual, which leads to a need for incident response. They're vulnerable to subversion, but then most importantly, they're, they've already happened. The behavior's already occurred. And so when Tom Phillips made Ridgeback, he understood really that at the core of the problem is that security, the control over an individual endpoint is a zero sum proposition. Someone can write to an endpoint, they control it, we don't. And so that really necessitates a very, very uh, quick identification of that problem and a reaction to it. So what Ridgeback um, is sort of unlike analytical tools or probabilistic tools in that it draws only on factually observed conditions in the network and it's designed to say, hey, is there some behavior, some set of behaviors that I know I need to respond to? And if I can see them in occurring in real time, then I can respond to them in real time. And by responding, we also mean uh, automatically so that they're counter-engaged. And that's where, um, where Ridgeback comes in. So uh, the, uh, the, the comparison I would make between Ridgeback and most of the AI-based tools is that uh, Ridgeback is fact-based or deterministic. It can act during connection, and it actually exerts an influence uh, both at layer two, two, three, four, and at layer eight, which is in the psyche of the attacker. Um, so it's a one megabyte file per network segment. Really, it's very easy to use, so it's simple. Um, it's, it's foundational. It's operating at layer two principally, and so everything in the environment is covered, IT, OT, IoT. Um, and, it, you know, it has a, uh, as you'll see, it has a deterrent effect because it actively engages uh, the adversary. And finally, it's, it's uh, so, such a small and easy product that it can be used on a laptop. Uh, it could be used for ongoing um, security, it could be used as an IT management tool. So the combination of these characteristics means that it's really hard to pigeonhole. So let's just go through um, real quick how Ridgeback behaves, and then we'll get to the meat of the discussion. But this is basically what's going on when an individual endpoint calls, uh, control falls to the adversary. They, they're gonna reconnoiter the environment, establish control over as many machines as they can so they can keep their position in the network. It might uh, look something like this. When Ridgeback, uh, one of the tricks, one of the capabilities in Ridgeback is to actually use the dark space right, um, and responds to any communications that are attempted in the dark space or in the unused ports and IPs. When that temp communication occurs with a phantom endpoint, Ridgeback freezes that connection and the process. It can convey disinformation uh, to the attacker. And this is really important. It doesn't affect any other device in the environment. No one, no other device perceives it's going on. Um, and it it's, uh, gives rise to countermeasures in our products that are, you know, escalated and more uh, designed to operate to isolate the offending machine from any further contact with any device in the environment. So it, if this is a standard um, sort of idea of an exploit and expanding control by the adversary, when Ridgeback is in operation, it's responding on absolutely everything and creating an extremely um, complicated and painful problem for the adversary. So that's the, that's the refresher. Um, and if, if there are any questions from last week or from this material, please, um, you know, let us know and, and I'll hand it over to Steve. Um, Elephant and Tom, and, and they'll take you through the uh, 
uh, product itself, the install and so forth. Okay, I am going to share. Um, I think I'm sharing the right thing. Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm getting stuff about how did the stream go. Can everybody see what uh, my screen is showing? It's showing the email that comes when you and we set up I don't a see it. I, I'm sorry. I, can, I can see it. Yes, I okay. can see it. Oh. And uh, a half dozen of you have gotten this email with your own license on it. This particular license is going to be disabled after this call. So don't worry about, you know, writing it down or anything. I'm just using it for this call for this demo. So the first thing you do when you get this email is go install Docker. Because <laughs> that can take a while. And it takes a reboot. And it has to have a WSL2 set up. So when you go to install Docker on Windows, um, it'll give you two options. Actually, let's go look at that. One is, uh, I already have it installed, so this isn't going to really, this might not give us those options, but as you're installing, it will, and I don't see the installer. I'm not going to worry about that. As you're installing, it will ask you if you want to do the, the Hyper-V version or the WSL2 version, and for Ridgeback, you have to do WSL2. And secondly, we need this NPCAT driver, DLL, so that it can do the deep packet stuff that it does. So I'm going to download this install.html that came attached. And I'll just put it in my downloads folder. And then I'm going to open it in my browser. Right there. And. Uh, this is all wrong. So when it's opened in your browser, when you put in your license info, it does save it in the local browser storage. So when you come back to it, you don't have to recopy. Um, and like if you get another install at HTML for an upgrade, it will, it will already be saved in the local storage. So you'll be able to just uh, already have it there, as you see. So we have the Docker desktop installed. Let's go look at what the NPCAP driver looks like. It's this top one for Windows, because I'm on Windows. You don't need that if you're installing on a Mac or Linux. Um, I've already got Docker desktop installed. Check that off. These check boxes are just for your convenience. They don't actually do anything as far as the install goes. But what's happening here is this license name and license key are, are being used along with the email. And this is the email that I'm going to register for my local Ridgeback server to be able to log in and uh, set up a core and do all the Ridgeback stuff. So these check boxes, you can just check them off as you go to kind of see where you're at. So I'm going to download the Docker Compose.yml. Um, if you know anything about Docker, you know that that's what the Docker Compose user to be able to pull in several containers and not have to worry about um, the Docker command line. And then I'll download this Ridgeback.env. This will actually get renamed to just plain .env which is a hidden file on Mac and Linux systems, and Windows has a hard time with it, but that, that's why we're calling it Ridgeback, and then the install script right here is going to rename it. So I'll go ahead and check these off as I do them. So this ridge, install ridgeback.cmd, for a Mac or Linux, it'll be .sh, and you can change that up here on the install. And it will change all the instructions and it will change the kind of file that you're downloading. I'll, I'll walk you through what this is doing um, as we go. So I'm going to download this. I will save it. 
I will check that off. Um, if there's a problem with this script, the manual instructions open up and it actually talks about what the script is doing. And on this install.html, you can click in any of these and it puts it in the uh, copy buffer. So when you click and then you can have a terminal open and you can just right click and it'll paste. But we are going to use the readback.cmd. So here it is and I will open it to run it and it should give you a warning. Uh, newer versions of Windows don't even let you download it until you tell it to get past. And you have to click on like more info and run anyway, or yes, I want to keep this and that kind of thing. And it's going to pop up a, I don't think this is showing on the screen share, but it's going to pop up one of those uh, access control things. And then it will open a terminal window. So this terminal window, the, the first line in this um, install ridgeback.cmd is actually just to get administrator with a with the .cmd file, and then it's we're going to make a ridgeback folder and copy in from the downloads the Docker compose.yml and that ridgeback.env to just env. So these are the files needed, and it sees that Docker is not running. I didn't have that started before. I should have because that can take a minute to come up. So if Docker's not running, it will alert you to that. And then when you hit enter, it'll check again. Um, because it's taking a minute to come up, it might pause for a minute. Anyway, once Docker comes up, this is going to connect to the Ridgeback um, Image, Docker image container thing. And then start downloading things. So we have to wait for Docker to come up. Uh, while we're waiting for Docker to come up, is there any questions or comments so far? How um, heavy is the is, does it run? Is it pretty lightweight? It's it's rel yeah, it's relatively lightweight. The uh, the Docker images, um, I think there's six of them. They don't seem to affect uh, any of my machines any more than a single Docker image from of, of anything else. Um, and the R core that runs, and they don't have to run on the same machine. The R core can run on a different machine. That's the piece that actually listens to the network traffic. That is less than one megabyte in size. I'll show you that when we get there. So Docker came up and here it is stopping because I had it in installed here previously. So it's stopping and removing those. But because this is set up so that if you are doing a new, ins or a, not a new install, but an upgrade, it won't remove the database container. Now in a production environment, we don't want to have a database inside of a container. We want to have a real database, you know, machine. But for the ambassadors, for, you know, the laptop all in one, we just run it in the container and it works. So after it got done running the, uh, or pulling in all the images and creating containers from them, then we started the database. We waited for it to come up. Ooh, I need to remove that REM because it should have stopped there and it didn't. Um, it didn't wait, but that's okay because I already had it going. Anyway, the DB init is a little container that simply modifies the database to add the the database itself, and then the tables that Ridgeback uses, and then it exits. And you only need to run it one time in a new database when you're setting up Ridgeback, but this script runs it automatically, and then it starts the rest of the container. Now, the script that runs our core is going to be a PS1. So it, the, it tries to set this execution policy remote sign so that you can right click and run it instead of having to open a terminal and type it in. Um, 
And then it's going to show you your IP addresses. We're going to set it up on the Wi-Fi. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that now because we're going to use that when we go to the next step, which is to go download the R-Core WAN. We go back to the install, basically. We've, we need to register our user. So we'll go to the Ridgeback server. That's our local host. And we have to enter in the email that we used in that install. It is in the .env, and if it's a different email, it will not work. It has to be spelled right and everything. You also need to register the user before you log in, though, Steve. Oh, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. This one, it's already registered. So it's going to error when I do this. And create, not able to register because it already has that user. So we'll just go and log in. Ridgeback.com. And I probably fumble finger the password. Mm. That's interesting. So what I'm gonna do in this case, and you and when when you run into things like this. Like maybe my old database was corrupt. I'm going to actually open a new uh, terminal window, a new PowerShell, and I am going to go into that Ridgeback folder. It's off of your users folder, Ridgeback, and I am going to manually remove that database and put in a, a new one. And the, the instructions for doing things like this are actually in that install HTML if you go down below. Um, here it's telling you how to remove the, the non-database containers if you make changes to the .env file. Um, it doesn't tell specifically how to remove the database, but it does tell you that you need to run db init if you pull in, if you do start with a new database. So we are going to go back up here. We're going to do a new database. And we have the new database, and now we need to run DB and it. And I need to actually use the run command. So that set up the database and the tables that it's going to need in that database. So we can close this and we can come back here and we can register. Now I'm going to go double check on install what my email address was. I'm going to actually copy and paste. I misspelled it. See that? I forgot the E, but because I already have that .env set up with this, I'm going to have to use that misspelling, or I could just go restart the server. But I'm just going to use the misspelling since we're here live. And it set it, and now we can add it in. It's hey, so a real quick, Steve. Does this mean it has to be? It could be offline completely. It doesn't actually have to be connected to online services. Well, the email is only used if you specifically set up an email server in that .env. So the email itself doesn't matter so much other than for a login. But if I like lost my password because I have a bad email, I'm gonna have to um, just kill the database and restart it. Uh, it actually does need to be online once every 12 hours to ping the license server. And after that, it can be offline. So once we have registered and we have logged in, we'll go back to the install. 
we can check off number seven. And now we're going to do number eight here. We're going to navigate to that our sources download page right here and download the Windows executable Arcore binary. Arcore win.exe, I'll save it here in my downloads folder. And if we go look at that in the folder, you can't execute it from here because it needs command line parameters. You can see that it's only 590 kilobytes. Um, other platforms, binaries like the Mac and the Linux one are a little bit, they're, they're different. They're all different. So, but uh, yeah, that's pretty small for what actually has to run. Anyway, we can close that, go back to our install. And we have done that. We've done this. So next we need to copy that file from downloads over to Ridgeback. But it's actually waiting to do this right here. So see how it says missing? That's where it stopped before, but it's no longer missing. It's there. So now it got that, and we're going to go step through install more. So now we're going to navigate to the Arcore area. And we need to set up a new core. So the core name can be anything. Um, I'm just going to call it core. The IP address needs to be the same as your Wi Fi adapter uh, for these laptop installs. For a production install, you'd want it to be the same as the machine you were putting the core on. And after you save it, you actually need to come right here. To the core ID to that little clipboard and and uh, click on that and it puts that information in your uh, copy paste buffer and now when we go to the next step okay so we've done 10 11 12 and now we're on 13. now if you click to get here from install it will bring over your license info if and then it saves it in these uh it's that other one again i need to make it empty and then refresh and i'm gonna have to turn that license off too that's okay so uh, it didn't work okay anyway it'll put in these the license here because it already has it, it, it saves it in your browser's local storage so that it's there for when you come in and make new scripts. Because the quick start um, makes the script. That didn't do it right. Oh, no, that's right. Okay. So the quick start is for having a script. The active one is with the uh, phantoms enabled. There's a passive one. That is for just listening. Um, it doesn't have the phantoms enabled. We're actually going to make both. Now I'm going to scroll down and make sure all these are filled out over here. If you want it to auto detect the IP in the Mac, you can just leave default um, what it's set to. For oh, that's something I missed. But for the a, a an Apple Mac install, it needs to be dollar sign and then the bracket Mac. To work but this either way works with windows the core id we're going to go double check that that core id is the one that i set up and not saved in here remember how um back here we had the core so d0759 d0759 that is the correct core and the encryption key is to encrypt the traffic between the r core and the manager that encryption key is kind of the default. It's what's in the .env. For a production install, you'd want to change that. So this script here that we're going to download just uh, set, detects the IP in the Mac and then uses it and puts it in a loop calling the R core binary. Um, so we're going to download the passive version and save it. And we're going to download an active version and save it. And then we're going to go back to the install script. When it sees run passive, it will copy all the runs that are in there. And then it will start run passive. So it detected that I had the IP 
uh, 192.168.1.11 and the MAC address. And this is what it looks like from the terminal when Ridgeback is running. So at this point, let's go back to the install and check off things and see if we've done everything. I believe we have. Yeah. So if you change the Arcor configuration and go into the Arcor configurator from the install, like I said, it, it puts in the uh, license information. Otherwise, you have to copy and paste it. But this Arcor config is actually a, you can see everything that Ridgeback can do. You can see all the different settings and Ridgeback is extremely versatile. There's so many things that it can do. That's why we have this quick start because it was overwhelming. So now we're going to go back to our install and we're pretty much done. Um, if the R core script isn't running, then you can open PowerShell as administrator. You can copy and paste that, but it's not run core. It's run active and run passive now. Uh, anyway, there we go. If you run into problems, you need to, like if it, uh, run, if you run it in a DOS window and it pops up with VC runtime.dll missing, um, that's what happens when it seems to fail silently. There's another situation where you don't have the NPCAP installed and it won't, it won't launch. Um, I think it gives an error when that happens. I don't remember. But you've got to have that NPCAP packet driver on Windows installed, not for Mac and Linux. And on Windows, again, you have to have that VC runtime DLL. Most people already have this. It comes with almost everything. It's just if you have a brand new setup system like a virtual server or something. Let's go look at the R Core page. That status is green. Remember how it was red before? The R Core puts, uh, throws a ping every 30 seconds just to kind of say it's turned on. We might see that in the logs, but my network is active enough that we're going to see other stuff. I have just a, a home network and we have a handful of PCs and a bunch of other devices like a camera. PVs, things like that on it. And Ridgeback is seeing this, it's seeing the metadata on the packets and recording it. And that's what it uses to build the network graph. So this is what it's seen really just since it started. I don't think it's been going for 10 minutes. Um, we can change that. Uh, so one thing we're seeing here is Something is scanning, 104. 104 has another version of Ridgeback running that did a surface scan, and I need to go turn that off so it doesn't cause problems. No, I'm going to leave it on because I'm going to stop the passive and start active, and 104 will think that every one of these IPs that it scans, there's something on it. Um, the network radar, we call this the popcorn screen. It just kind of pops up as it sees traffic go by. The Incident Explorer is very useful when you actually see threats. Uh, we haven't been running it long enough to see threats, so we're going to just leave that for the moment and go back to the... where this is running and stop it. So control C will stop it, or you can close the X. And then to start it again, you can do it from the command line. Run active. Oh, we're in download and it's in Ridgeback. So we need to see you into our Ridgeback folder. Sorry. We're and then here we can do dit slash run here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm too used to a uh, Linux product. So as it starts, it's detecting the IP. It says connection attempt one. And then you can actually configure how many packets go by before it starts showing data on the command line. That's in the artwork config. I think I have it set to 100 packets. And let's see, 
So that particular parameter here is uh, I think it's about 200. Oh, I have it on a thousand because my network's busy. That's the report frequency. That's how often it comes up. And that's also in the monitoring. The monitoring? No, it's in the reporting tab. So reporting is the stuff that is reported on the terminal. Monitor is the stuff that gets sent to the database to build that graph with. Let's go back to that graph. Now that we set active, these are phantoms. So these answered for the IP that had nothing on it. Um, let's see. And now we can go and look at the Incident Explorer and we'll actually have something there. We have two recon threats. 000, zero is an R4. It's probably that other one that I'm using. Dot one dot five. Let's see what it looked for. It did an ARP request to dot one dot four, and nothing was there. So the phantom responded, "Hey, I have that." Now these are recon threats because ARPs are simply, you know, what's the MAC address of the person that has this IP? There, there's not actually data sent, but any TCP packet sent, like a ping, is an actual uh, potential for a real threat because it, it actually sends in data. There's actually a content to the packet. So a ping would come across as an active threat. And I'm gonna show you, oh, it already did it. Okay, so let's see what, what port it was trying to open. 9100, I wonder what that is. Does anybody know off the top of their head what 9100 is? Crickets. VNC. Oh, maybe. Uh, is it the default? I don't know. It could be. It could be. I do have VNC going in this network. So I'm going to close some of these tabs and refresh. It's actually good to have multiple tags open um, because this network graph. If it's like your base of operation, and then as you go and investigate stuff, you can just right click and open it in a new tab. So it looks like I've got five, and if I so, if I click on it, I'll get more information. The OUI so, is not defined. Go ahead. Uh, port uh, TCP port ninety one hundred uh, mm -hmm. is typically an HP JetDirect printer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the the printer. Okay. Yeah. And there was a machine on dot four that's not there any longer. So that makes sense. See, the thing is, really, if something is looking for something in the dark space, there's something broken in the network. Um, if you can figure out what it is, then you can do things like go back here to the Incident Explorer and say, oh, I know what that was. Uh, that was dot five looking for the printer. And then I can resolve it. And it won't up again until it happens again. If it happens again, it will show up again. Uh, so now this dot 10, let's see what ports it was looking for. Oh, it's all over the place. Huh. Yeah, I don't know what those are. Oh, dot 10 is the one attempting the scan. That's right. So it is scanning all over the place. Because it has an end map running, I need to actually go disable that. Because it's just getting the phantom answers. So dot ten could be considered in, in this case a, a mal actor, a bad actor. Um, if you have a DNS server set up for your local machines, then the host instead of enot found is the host name. The OUI, as you know, comes from the MAC address, and if it's undefined, then it doesn't know what it is. Let me show you something really cool for figuring out what's going on. If you click on this box, it unfreezes the physics engine. And then if you click on these curved lines, you can see multiple communications from different protocols. So for example, here, uh, let's focus on the threats. And so we can look at just the ones that have gone. And we have to restart the physics engine. 
And this, this can scroll in and out with your mouse wheel. And you can also use these particular icons. So I am going to scroll in. So 110 has done ARPS to 11, but it has done, uh, let's see, PCP to 35 and ARPS back and forth. Now see how this 35 has some arrows that are going back this way? That's because the phantom answered. So it, on these two arrows, the marked, marked out and said, has 11, 11 answered and said, I have it. So the arrows show the traffic and the lines show what the protocol was. Also, um, here we'll refresh and I'll show you all the LOMs. These leaky pipes, this is MDNS and LOMNR. Looks like we have a lot more problem threats now. Uh, but in, in a home network, you know, they help make it plug and play. But in a, in a business network, you don't want to have those. Um, I am seeing so many. If these all have the same Mac, it means I've got another. Let's go to the, my, <laughs> my grandkids are visiting, and so we have a lot of devices after. So here in reports, we can go to the endpoint inventory, opening a new tab, and we can see a list of what it has seen. So it has seen this IP address with these Mac addresses. And part of this is because I've got another hardcore running. Should have turned it off before this meeting. And that's where all these are coming into this MAC address. Um, but if it's a real MAC address from a company that's in the list, it will show up in the OUI org chart. Uh, host name show up if you have DNS set up. Very handy when you're doing something like looking at this host name leakage summary, and you can see what was being said as they asked for things. Okay, let's go back to the threat summary. This is going to show us all the threats that it's seen. And if you want to see the port, you can go to the Incident Explorer and and add the destination port column to figure out what it was, what it was trying to do. And so we're going to filter in here and look for only the things that have a destination sim set as one, because that means that it's a phantom. It means that it was simulated. That's what sim stands for. So we actually are going to sort by these. Are the actual the ARPs, of course, or recon threats? And uh, my network is busier than I realized. 60 seconds. And uh, the TCP attempts have been showed a port number, the destination port. Um, Tom, can you step in and talk more on the, uh, the different things that we could see in the network graph while I go turn off that other ARC work? Um, well, I, I would, so this was meant to be the installation. So I, I mean, that's, that's good. For oh, now. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think I'm done then in that case. I'm open yeah. Oh, real quick. If anyone from the, that actually has the software, if you guys have questions or any hiccups, please bring it up. Yeah. The six or seven of you got the, uh, the software. Um, and, and I'll catch up with the others that have asked after this broadcast. Um, but I do need to go turn off that other group chat. So just a question in regards to like enterprise deployments. Um, mm -hmm. does, does your guys' system, I see that it's all Docker-based. Does it support um, Docker Swarm and Kubernetes deployments? Yes. Yes. Anything that will run the containers. Okay. Got it.
Well, all right. If we uh, don't have any more questions, I'll go ahead and shut down our stream. Thank you all. Oh, for, I, have a, I have a question. I don't know if people have formed a view or not, but uh, as I as I said when I opened up, it's really hard for even for ourselves to put Ridgeback into any like specific category. Um, oh. Hello? Yeah, we're yeah, here. You okay, so I, I, I was just curious if, 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 as people out there have sort of seen this or talked to us last week or are starting to think about it, is, is there any, like, what analogies would you make to other tool sets that are out there? I'm just kind of curious to hear from the group. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of working with the with it for a little bit. I definitely would put it under some sort of intrusion detection because it does enable. Um, I, I like the analogy used before about being a landmine, and so it does do some component of intrusion detect. Uh, you know, the hitting a landmine. Hey, this is a unfavorable action, but I think it has additional components um, like AMTD that are automated moving target defense that allows some uniqueness to it. Um, but you, you're kind of doing it a different way, so it's kind of a, a different way to handle it. Uh, yeah. I don't know what your that, thoughts was that be, you, Kevin? Uh, Was that you, Kevin? Uh, yes, that was me. Yeah. So it's funny because when you look at the Gartner category descriptions, you know, assuming Gartner is, you know, the, the arbiter of what categories are out there, they they describe the um, the effect and the method when they uh, describe their categories. So they'll describe XDR with the designed intent of the product plus the methods that it uses to achieve the designed intent. And that and and if we have to meet that test, we don't fit in any category because we're we don't see other layer two products. We don't see other products that in inject signal. There's a lot of sources of differentiation. And of course, that doesn't mean we're um, not creating a certain effect for the for the user in, in the administering IT or security. So it's, it is a, it's a really interesting challenge for us to talk about Richback with folks who have, uh, you know, dedicated themselves to the idea that there are certain categories they want to have in their network environments and so on. Would you say that there is some similar functionality as like uh, canaries? Uh, kind of like from, I, I believe it's like Thinkus Canary, um, the company. And speaking on the whole landmine idea where, you know, yeah, you have yeah. this, you're sitting out these dummy device, you know, these, uh, not dummy devices, but they're like these devices that are like landmines and somebody touches them and then you get alerted on it. Yeah. Tom, how would you respond to that? Yeah, there is a canary aspect to it. Um, it's kind of like a dual use canary, though, because it's, I mean, you could use those phantoms to see if you've got IT that's doing things that you don't want it to do. For example, you've got something pointed to a server that you moved, and now it's pointing to an IP that's not used, and that'll show up as a phantom. So they're not, you know, they're not specifically um, canaries. You know, they, they have multiple uses. But yeah, okay. from a security perspective, the fact that, like, for example, me, when I'm at a network, the fact that I see a phantom light up means uh, that's like a uh, like I'm looking out in a field at night and a spotlight shines in a certain area of that field. And I know to look there and I know something's going on there. I, I don't you know, initially, you don't know if it's malicious or not, but um, you, you at least know where to look and where how to do your forensics, like where to trace back to the network. Is there any special setup that needs to be done if you're running like uh, vulnerability scanning s software on the network, like Nessus and Expose? Uh, you act, yeah, you actually saw that. So that scanning was not uh, Steve deliberately scanning. He actually had something off on the side of the network that was doing a scan. Uh, so when it popped up, it was kind of unexpected. So if you don't want that stuff to trigger phantoms, you have to configure the R core and say ignore the traffic from you know, wherever your vulnerability scanner is or don't present phantoms to it so that it can operate normally. Okay, got it. You're basically whitelisting your, your scanners.
Who here um, from the 044 group? Did anyone is, actually uh, playing, follow along with the install and get it uh, running? Who had the uh, the uh, product before we started? I started working on it, and then I ran into some issues with my VM. I was running it on, so I work. I have a question. Plan. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you know where? Uh, how do you place the different networks within the network? Within the graph. Uh, uh, how do you place the different? The sorry, say it again. How how do you know where the different networks go within the visualization? The network graph image is a uh, a graph that's updated in real time, where it's the endpoints are the you know the boxes are the live endpoints, so things with MAC addresses, and the lines between them are a fact of communications, and there it's a directed graph. So you actually there are arrows. So if you zoom in on that, you'd see the little arrows, and then there's protocol labeling on the links themselves and the edges, and so you, it's basically showing you the um, the topology of the live network, not necessarily of the physical structure of the network, but of the communication patterns that are going on so that you can step back and do traffic analysis on your own network. Okay. Thanks. I know uh, I went through the deployment and uh, I was able to get it running on like uh, my Wi-Fi box. And so I was able to kind of like scan a couple different uh, Wi-Fi machines and stuff like that. Um, I I appreciate that I could take it to one of my Wi-Fi networks because I have too many uh, around my property and go to another Wi-Fi network. And it's kind of automated in the sense that it just went straight to it and started remapping the network as a security tool that was mobile. I kind of appreciate that aspect of it. Right, right. That's the sort of idea that if you want to figure out how stuff's working in a network, you just take your laptop from one segment to the next and you know do diagnostics on the fly in, in minutes. Now, when you guys do yeah. like an enterprise deployment, you're taking this, that one, uh, what you, it's a one megabit file or... 10 megabit file, I can't remember. Yeah. You're deploying that on each uh, VLAN or each interface uh, to one per One per layer to broadcast domain. So it kind of okay. depends how you structure the network. But it's, it's uh, by comparison with, you know, having to have an agent on every endpoint, this is, you know, very straightforward. You just need one, one of the R cores per network segment. And it'll also show you any kind of IoT or OT stuff on the network. So, for example, scanner devices or refrigerators or you know whatever else might be on the network. And so, and it actually that makes a lot of sense too, because in passive mode, it's not like you're going to be scanning, especially like OT devices, where they'll be very sensitive to any type of scanning tools. But uh, okay, that makes sense from like a passive perspective, especially. Yeah. You'll, so you'll yeah, still... if you're in a skate environment, go ahead, Tom. You'll still see them, and if it's in passive mode, for example, it won't it won't disrupt them, it won't disturb them. Uh, you can also run it in active mode, but just don't run the scanner. So the the scanner is a, another container that you can run. So by default, it just starts up with everything else. But you can you can customize the containers, and so you only run certain ones, for example, or not run others. So if you don't want to do any network scans, you just don't start the network scanner container. And by network scans, I'm talking about uh, port scans, right? Uh, the, the network mapping is not done through scanning. It's done through um, basically an interactive thing on the at the layer two. Got it. Sounds good. Thank you. Is, is there any support for like passive scanning via like mirror ports? Which ports? Like, like mirrored ports on the network. Anything for like like more positive. oh 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 yeah for like uh to put it on a span or a tap or something like that yeah yeah you you can do that and uh so the the one catch is that uh the R core will um, occasionally inject ARPs and other traffic to try to maintain what's live and not live on the network 
And if it cannot inject, then it's slower and has a more difficult time in trying to figure out what's live on the network. And so if you connect the uh, a machine running the R core to a span or a mirror port, it's only getting that data feed, you know, the data collection, it can't inject. And so it can't necessarily uh, stay on top of uh, what's live and not live. And so you get a different, the whole display has a very different kind of flavor to it, how it represents things and what it shows. Um, if it's if it's in a read, basically that's a read only mode, right? If it can only read from a span or a mirror or a tap or such. Okay. And then what about um, like, are you guys have like an open roadmap at all? Of like what features that are coming down the pipe that you guys are like public about? There's not a public roadmap. Uh, you can get a sense of things if you look at the help for the R core. Um, so there's some things that are already in there that, that we haven't really talked about and publicized yet, like uh, bridging interfaces and uh, being able to modify the traffic as it goes between the interfaces and stuff. Uh, but none of that stuff set in stone and none of it's announced publicly at this point. Okay. What about any, um, any sort of like... Um... I don't know if you guys like got any support for like Terraform or um, anything like that for like automated deployments, or maybe like other like uh, like vagrants, um, things like that. We don't have any uh, scripts or declarative files describing Ridgeback deployments, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. So everything. So the install is always kind of like that manual process for for right now. It, it is right now, but it's, I mean, it's, if if you saw a lot of things are script driven and it's pretty straightforward to wrap this in, in whatever you want, right? It's, when, when I made Ridgeback, you know, I think of it as a tool meant to be used with other tools. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy to just wrap it into something else. Okay. And what about uh, API support? Do you guys have, are your APIs kind of publicly, um, available for um, for like in, in documentation? We, we haven't written up a document yet. So we've had someone else ask about that. It's a, uh, yeah, let me, someone let, else. Let me step in there, Tom. Actually, okay. the API is documented all over the web. It's a SQL. Oh, it's no, SQL. no, no. Okay. Well, no, oh. so there, yeah. So there's, uh, you can access the databases, right? Or, well, there's, okay, so there's the database server which is MariaDB or MySQL, for example. And it has multiple databases and you can go in and see those, inspect those schemas and see what that stuff is. And then there's the uh, the RESTful API, uh, which is basically a JWT. So you, you've got to connect to it, get a JWT, and then you have to use that every time you connect to it. But we have not yet put into documentation how to call that stuff, right? We don't have the uh, uh, the the web methods documented yet. Okay. So that's something, that's something that's coming down the, down the pipe. Yes. Yes. Because yeah, someone else has already asked for that. And so um, it, it, I, I wouldn't expect it quickly. And, you know, we, because of what they're doing, we'll probably work with them, you know, privately. Uh, but at some point, yes, these things will be exposed and yeah. Well, I mean, there are, there are, they're already exposed. It's just, we haven't documented so we're yeah, we're not you know we're not a a crack documentation shop at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah, documentation's documentation's hard, and it's typically the last thing too. I get it, at least from my end. Um, okay, cool. And then I know since there's a lot of military folks here, uh, are you guys? Um, I assume you guys probably are working with the military already potentially, but are you? Do you guys have like FIP certification? There's no FIP certification yet. We're working on getting a, a interim approval to test at this point. Uh, there, there's a, you know, it's, we've been speaking. I, yeah. I, I don't know how much, I, I'll leave that to Scott to how much he wants to talk about that. But yes, we're, we're working with folks. I'm, I'm not hearing the questions. So I don't, I don't know what's wrong with my feet. What, what military uh, stuff do, do we have involvement with the military now? The United States. Yeah, military. Yes, yes. Yeah, I was just asking no, about the, the certification, but it sounds like that's a work in progress. Correct. Okay. Correct. Cool. And then that, any, that's a, that's any, in a pipeline right now. It's it's a long process to get that stuff. So, have you guys gone through any third party audits? 
as well for like the I guess the security regarding the the product. No third party audits at this time. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for letting me ask all the questions. <laughs> We are very cutting edge. Uh, sounds uh, yeah. cool. No, definitely. Uh, I really, uh, as you kind of mentioned it to me, uh, automated uh, moving target defense stuff, and I was like, I haven't heard that in a long, uh, in a good minute. And I'll go read back up on it. Super cutting edge stuff. I definitely is. Uh, for those who haven't heard of it yet, uh, highly recommend looking into it. And I could see where you guys do definitely say like, yeah, it's we're a little bit of that, but not quite because. Um, some of those components on how they implement it, but very interesting stuff. Uh, and that's some of the bleeding edge stuff right now in cybersecurity. Oh, well, I guess maybe another question that might be somewhat related is I, I assume um, with the deployments that, that you guys support like cloud, there's no issues running it in the cloud itself, like AWS, Azure, GCP, things like that. So actually, you need layer two access, and uh, places like Azure and AWS and Google Cloud, they do not provide layer two access. You don't really have any visibility or control over the network in those environments. And so it's a different way of doing things. You've actually got to put an R core in every endpoint if you want to inspect the traffic going in and out of that endpoint. Uh, there is a positive to that in that you get to see every connection going into and, and out from every endpoint that you deploy it. But in general, it's not, um, you know, I, I didn't design it to be deployed into the cloud necessarily. It's, okay. it's designed for on-premise networks because those are, you know, those are really your, uh, uh, I'll call it your soft targets. Uh, for cloud deployments, the, the, the main vulnerabilities are things that uh, like stolen credentials. And, um, and, it's, and, and you don't exploit cloud resources the same way you exploit a, like an on-premise network. Yeah, got it. That makes sense. Well, awesome. Does anyone else have any questions? All right. Well, hey, Scott and um, Tom and Steve, I really appreciate you guys coming out and demoing it again and kind of doing a bulk install. Um, I know for those who have some questions on it, uh, Steve uh, posted up his, the email address. If you guys are interested in getting ambassador access, just go ahead and reach out to him. Uh, I think it was in meetup text, if I'm not mistaken, Steve. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, how come you get access layer two? Say again? What was the question? Hello? Oh, yes. uh, so, so, so the question was in the cloud, uh, why can't you ins uh, inspect uh, layer two? They, uh, they don't present it to you. So uh, the, the, the cloud services are not like uh, leased servers. They have their own infrastructure and they're constantly building their own uh, network infrastructure um so they you know they simply don't give you that access there is no if you if you sniff the network adapter there's no you get no layer two from it and, and that's a you know that's a trade-off because then what they're uh what they can do is they can have these web interfaces that let you reconfigure the network on the fly but that's because it's not like a real you know you, you don't have real access to real routers and switches, you have accesses, access to their their like meta infrastructure. I'm sure they've got terms for it, but they, I mean, each of the cloud services are constantly reinventing and they split into separate teams inside their own organizations. And in some cases they kind of compete with each other and other cases they don't necessarily work with each other. So it's not, cloud stuff is not like a normal networked environment. At, at least not from the end user perspective. No, 100% makes sense.
All right. Is uh, any other questions? All right. Well, hey, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, Steve, I know uh, you kind of hopped on when I said it, but uh, I know Steve posted up his email. If you don't mind, Steve, just dropping it one more time in Meetup Text. For those who are looking for ambassador access, I don't know if that's something you guys are still uh, open to helping sure. uh, with some members. Sure. Oh, you're yeah. awesome, Scott. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, you do. You will have to sign an NDA, uh, and then you'll kind of go, go through the provisioning process of there. So, hey, Scott, again, thanks. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. And Tom, taking the time. I know you guys are not on the West Coast, so it's a little late for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do appreciate you guys coming out uh, again. Uh, looking forward to future talks. Uh, okay. Moving forward. And no everybody problem. should just Thank get in much. get in touch with us. Yeah, get in touch with us on on anything you want to talk about. We'll talk about our product. We'll get it, get it to you, and we'll work through an install. Yeah, and Steve and company, please drop your uh, your LinkedIn profiles if you guys are cool with that in the channel as well too. We'd love to uh, connect and uh, and and share some feedback once we all get it installed and start playing around with it. Uh.